All righty. Good morning, downtown. Good morning to all of those that are at the campuses who will be watching on the stream as well. My name is Ross Lester, and I'm the campus pastor um, at the West Campus of the Austin Stone. It's just a, a treat to be able to be with you here this morning. Why don't you open your Bibles, if you, if you would, uh, to Jonah. We'll be in the second part of the first chapter of Jonah in the second week of an eight-week study through this action-packed little narrative. And we said last week that this narrative is so familiar, and yet it is so profoundly strange to our sensibilities at the same time. Why, why do we find this story strange? Well, a few reasons. The first reason is uh, it's strange because the good guy is actually a bad guy and he's yet still a good guy. And so while most of the books of the prophets tell of how God uses a prophet to speak to his people, this narrative tells us primarily of how God speaks to a prophet by using a foreign people. But we love clear cut characters. And I love how the Bible lets even its heroes reveal their faults. And so we don't really know what to do with Jonah. And part of the reason for that is he's a lot like us. He has great moments of obedience and great moments of rebellion. He's a great prophet of Israel who has huge ministry success and he's a whiny, annoying, prejudicious rebel at the same time. He's able to say yes to God in dramatic ways and able to say no to God in certain areas of his life. I am grateful that the Holy Scriptures are honest enough to reveal that we are complex like that because it helps us to find some space in the narrative. Secondly, it's strange because it's miraculous. And this is strange to our modern or postmodern or post postmodern sensibilities. We don't really know what to do with a God who interrupts what we truly perceive to be a closed system and natural order. And we covered this last week, and so I don't want to cover it again at length today, but I will briefly say it again, as many of you may not have been here or you may have nodded off at a point in the sermon, which is common and okay. It is important to note when we come to a text like like this, this text doesn't allow us to see it purely as midrash or allegorical or, or just jump to its didactic properties and not actually deal with some of the facts. It's rooted in history that it happened to a real prophet. Jesus confirms this when he teaches from this book later on. And so then we've got to go, well, what do we do with a fish that swallows a person and keeps them in their stomach for three days and then vomits them out? That's pretty weird, but just stop for a second. I said to the guys at West last week, it is weird. But if I look at things that are weird in the Bible, this doesn't even make the top 10. It's not close. We believe that God spoke and the world came to be. We believe that the animals went in two by two, hurrah, hurrah, onto the ark, all right? And that the predators didn't eat any of the tasty beasts on there and that they made it all out onto the other side and that from a single family line, God starts the families of the earth. We believe that Jesus really came to the world, was really born of a virgin. There's been lots of teenage girls that have claimed miraculous conception, but this one um, is true. We believe that he really could turn water into wine and that even with that power, he really did not sin. We believe that he really went to the cross, that he really died in our place, and that he really rose from the dead. You wanna hear something weird in the Bible? We believe that a dead man rose. Everything else is like, yeah, okay, that's, anything's possible. Anything's possible. To be a Christian is to believe in the miraculous. Our whole worldview hangs upon that premise. So don't be freaked out by the fish. If God sends a fish, I go like, all righty. That's fine, it's his fish, it's his world, it's his ocean, it's his prophet. He does what he wants, fine with that. Lastly, it's strange because it reveals a God who loves people that we hate. And it reveals a God who forgives people that we loathe. And it reveals a God who reaches after people that we would rather avoid. It is a seriously disorienting tale of grace and grace by its nature is supposed to be disorienting. Otherwise, we probably aren't believing it quite right just yet. This is a story about God chasing down rebels with that remarkable disorienting grace, as is described in the big central statement of the book, which is this, salvation belongs to the Lord. If you wanna know what's the big idea of Jonah, that's it, salvation belongs to the Lord, it's from him, it's for him, it's to him, it's about him, it belongs to him. Okay, let's jump into the text today. 
Remember where we were with Jonah? He was in outright rebellion, running from God, and the call on his life to be an agent of grace to his enemies. He's been sent to the Ninevites who have been, it's been prophesied in Jonah's generation, are gonna come and destroy Judah. So he hates them, he fears them, he doesn't wanna have anything to do with them, and he certainly doesn't wanna go preach to them because he knows God is a God of mercy and God is gonna forgive the Ninevites and graft them into some kind of covenantal family, and he hates that idea. And so instead of going to the city of his enemies, Nineveh, he decides to go to Spain instead, which I get. Spain is wonderful, and he wants to sit on the beach and eat some paella and meet a wonderful Mediterranean young lass and just spend the rest of his prophetic retirement just enjoying the benefits of living on the med. Um, But pay close attention to what God does next. Now, this is big. We know enough from reading the Bible that God doesn't need Jonah to save Nineveh. He's choosing to include Jonah in the salvation of the people in Nineveh. He doesn't need him. So we would expect that when he rebels, God would do one of two things. Either would just ignore him and go to a plan B, or he would punish him, right? And teach him a lesson, that pesky little rebel. What God does actually is pursue him in grace. It's really, really stark to see and humbling to consider. Let me read through the whole text this morning, and I'll just have three brief observations for you. From verse four. But the Lord. <laughs> Jonah's just said a big no to God. He's just like, not thought about it, no thank you. Um, I'm gonna go a, another route. And what do we expect God to do next? You know, thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening, something of that order, right? And then he crushed him like the little stink bug that he was and kicked him forever from his sight. No, but the Lord, we expect him to turn his back on Jonah and he turns to face Jonah. Oh man, when I think in my life of how many but the Lord situations I have, but for the grace of God. Been many times when I think something has been broken beyond repair, but the Lord. There've been many times when I've thought there've been people too far gone from God's grace, but the Lord. There have been many times when I have thought I am just too wicked and depraved to be used in the good purposes of God, but the Lord. Look at what he does. I love this image, right? If you like English literature, this is a moment to geek out a little bit, okay? This wasn't written in English, by the way, but it's still beautiful in the English. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Just as a side note, you've got to hear Sinclair Ferguson preach this passage, right? He says, but the Lord hurled, all right? When it's got two syllables, it's somehow just more authoritative, right? Hurled, um, rolling R's and two syllables. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Now, now, now as someone who, who, who did a little bit of English studies at university, I just love the sentence and just the whole way that Jonah has written. It's beautiful. Look at the imagery in this. It speaks in beautiful metaphor of God throwing a storm like a warrior throws a javelin and so he isn't just going ah a storm he picks his spot and he says there's Jonah on that ship and he lines it up and he hurls a storm upon the sea surrounding Jonah and how does the ship respond look at the beautiful personification of the ship it responds by saying look I didn't sign up for this right and so I'm telling you if this continues I'm gonna break up all right we're just gonna be friends after this we're gonna have to move in separate directions and so it's the the creaking of the ship speaks back listen there's no major point in there but I love the poetry of scripture it shows that there's space to be creative and a Christian at the same time and these things remain beautifully true. If you've got a poet in you, brilliant, let it spill onto the page for Christ's glory. Verse five, then the mariners were afraid. Now when you think mariners, don't think the baseball team from Seattle because they're afraid of everybody, right? But um, (laughs) these were seafarers, okay? You like that? (laughs) Studying American culture, I've got no idea what that means, but a friend friend told me it would be funny, all right, okay? The mariners were afraid. So think crusty old seafarers. Did you ever watch the show Deadliest Catch? While you should have been studying for something, right? These crusty old seafarers, people have spent most of their life at sea. It takes a lot to get them afraid on the sea, these men are afraid, and they each cried out to his God. Polytheism is so funny, it's just like calling all pockets, right? It's just like, you have a go, you have a go, you have a go, let's see who wins. 
and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. This is amazing. These are tough men and they are terrified and they are now throwing their life's earnings into the sea, their precious cargo. They're chucking it overboard. They think they're done. Uh, This is a supernatural storm and they don't think they're gonna make it out of this. They're gonna die. Where's Jonah? But Jonah. But the Lord. But Jonah. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. If we've got that one friend who can sleep through anything, here he is, fast asleep. And so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will, uh, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. This is powerful, friends. Here you have a pagan seafarer repeating a command of the Lord to Jonah, the prophet of God, and the irony is obvious. Arise, call out. Who was the last one who said that to Jonah? God. <laughs> now you've got a pagan seaman going, hey, arise. Call out, and so the call comes to Jonah again. God in his sovereignty puts the call again on the lips of a man who doesn't even yet believe in him. What a thing. There's such a clear contrast in the narratives. The call to Jonah is arise, go, and yet Jonah goes down, down. He's supposed to arise, go to Nineveh. He goes down to Joppa. He's supposed to rise and call out to his God. He goes down into into the ship. He goes down into the sea. He goes down into the belly of the whale. Or large fish, sorry. There's gonna be some scholars in here going, we've got no evidence it was a whale. I, I'm, I'm sorry. All right. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. Now, let's just stop for a second. Sometimes the scripture is prescriptive. It says you should do this. Sometimes the scripture is purely descriptive. It just says they did this. And time and time again in the scripture, they cast lots right? They, 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 they roll the dice and God controls even the dice. This is still not a good metric for decision making in the Christian life, okay? Right? I don't know if we should get married or not. Rock, paper, scissors. Let's go, okay? And that's, that's, that's not really how it's supposed to play. Maybe God in his sovereignty would still rule over um, the outcome of rock, paper, scissors. But, but I love how the sovereignty of God even rules over the casting of pagan dice. What an amazing thing. And so they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Right, nothing's changed. This is what we ask people, second question after we've met them. Um, what do you do, right? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, now this would have been astonishing to them. I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. You can almost hear them on the ship going like, you're right. You sure you fear the Lord? Then how are we in this mess? I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. The Hebrews were the only monotheists in the area which was seen as supreme arrogance in that day. It still is, by the way. But this helps us to understand how Jonah speaks of his God. He says, you've got a God of the seas and a God of the dry land. My God made the sea and the dry land. He's basically, even though he's been called out, still saying, my God is significantly better than your God. And he is correct in that moment. He's saying he isn't just a deity over one thing or element or area. He is Lord over all. Now, what is the great irony? What great irony of a statement from a man who is at that moment refusing to live under the Lordship of God? We can believe stuff and not do it all at the same time. It's been humanity's struggle from the beginning. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, right? Their whole worldview is being dismantled. Maybe we're wrong about God. Now they're exceedingly afraid and they said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them that was part of the conversation we don't get to see in the text. Then they said to him, what shall we do? that the sea may quiet down for us, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Friends, the gap of hypocrisy between Jonah's belief and Jonah's behavior, listen, had consequences on other people and they were furious about it and desperate to put it right. We tend to think of our rebellion against God as very personal and very private in its nature and in its impact. Something that is just between us 
and God. So what's the big deal? But our rebellion, friends, our resistance to living out our beliefs as the people of God actually has major consequences for people around us as it did for these mariners. It keeps us, prevents us from being true islands of hope in seas of hopelessness in society. We tend to think, this is the wrestle, right? We tend to think that in our generation, maybe the world would be better off if we had a more private and more moderate sort of faith. That isn't the case. What people who don't yet believe in God need from us is actually obedience, (laughs) not more rebellion. They need us to be the people of God. It's the very thing that they are looking for. And our failure to be that impacts them negatively and not positively. All of the compromises you're making in obedience to fit in with your friends hurts them, doesn't help them. Verse 12, he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Now I'm just gonna be honest and say, I don't know why he comes up with this impulse. It might be, some say it's just a suicide pact. It's just like, because then it'll be done and over, okay, and I don't have to listen to you whining anymore, all right? And, and then I don't have to go to Nineveh, because I'll just go to the bottom, all right? And so it might be that in desperation, he's just going to just kill me, all right? Because that was the consequence. That was gonna be the logical consequence. He wasn't gonna survive. It might be that he thinks he can atone somehow for the sins, which is weird for a Hebrew. I'm not really sure how he comes up with this conclusion, but even the pagans find it alarming then the sea will quiet down for you for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. He's saying, well, if you remove me from the situation, God will just pursue me and then he'll leave you um, uh, uh, on your own. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. I love this. Sometimes unbelievers behave more like believers than believers do. You ever felt this? Not long before this, Jonah was seemingly very unconcerned with the fate of the lives of the sailors, sailors, and yet now they are trying to spare his life. So they try to row themselves out of the problem of sin that they're all stuck in, but inevitably it doesn't work. But they're displaying mercy towards a man who displayed no mercy towards them. Verse 14. Therefore they called out to the Lord. Who? The mariners. That's amazing. They're persuaded that there's one God now that they need to call out to. Oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Oh man, they they, they don't quite have the gospel yet because they're saying, I don't wanna die for someone else. They're not realizing someone else will die for them in an amazing move of grace. And lay not on us innocent blood for you, oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. They get the sovereignty of God, they got no problem with it. And so they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Now, now, now what happens next? We kind of picture him paddling for a while. No, no, he's gonna tell us in the text next week that he sinks to the bottom and that seaweed wraps around his head. He's gone. He's gone from their view. They think he's drowned. It's over. It's finished. What do they respond with? Well, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. This is amazing. The polytheists are now believers holding a church service on their boat after their first baptism of sorts, although it wasn't a particularly successful one. Um, And I'm glad we have a new covenant view of baptism now. It's just like, let's hurl you into the sea, see what happens. Um, And I don't think it would be baptizing many people. But they come to this conclusion. Hey, salvation really does belong to the Lord. And God does really get what God wants. We've got no other conclusion by reading this text. He wanted to save some pagans through Jonah, And he does, even in the midst of rebellion and refusal. Oh, how great and how merciful is our God. Verse 17, and the Lord appointed. Don't you love this? He's like, fish, you're up. And the fish is like, right? And it just responds um, in worship and just swims towards God's desired. um, We'll edit that out, that was inappropriate. But uh, it just swims towards God's desired uh, place for him in the ocean to swallow up Jonah. And can you imagine, I mean, I can't imagine what a fish thinks at any given moment, but he's like, you want me to eat this? He's like, eat that. Whole, whole. He's like, he looks gross. Eat it. Okay, all right. And the fish just obeys the voice of the Lord and goes and swallows Jonah whole. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, which we'll deal with next week. But if you think 
the outside of a fish smells unpleasant. Imagine the inside. God presses them into the most uncomfortable, death-filled space. Just incredible to consider. All right, let me just make three observations for you. And I'm out of your hair this morning. I wanna warn you that what I say over the next few minutes would not pass. I would not get a passing grade at a, in a preaching class at seminary for a number of reasons, to be sure, but primarily for, for this reason. When they teach you to preach at seminary, they say every main point must be the same length, otherwise people don't track with you. That's not gonna be the case today. I'm gonna spend 80% on point one and then just kinda Try, try finish with point two and three, okay? Just try speed to the finish line with whatever time we have left. It's like, uh, by default, this point is three minutes long because that's how much time I got, all right? And so that's gonna be the way it goes. But for those of you who are Galatian timekeepers and who are trying to track through the sermon uh, pace, uh, don't worry when we get to the end of point one. That's not gonna prolong past lunchtime. I'm just getting going, all right? And I'll land the plane very quickly after that. I like to know where I'm going, so you're welcome. First one, God in his grace, listen to this, in his grace, God in his grace can calm storms, oh yes he can, but God in his grace can also send storms. He can calm them, yes, but he can also hurl them on the sea of our lives in order to bring us back to where we need to be. Now listen, it is tough to read this text if you don't believe in a sovereign God. Let me just explain that word for you for a second. Sovereign just means supreme or ultimate, all right? And so when we say God is sovereign, we mean that there is nothing that is beyond his control, that he rules and reigns over everything. And when you read this text, it just speaks of that. You can't get around it. He sends the storm. He ensures the outcome of the lot. He calms the storm. He sends the fish. It's, it's unbelievable, so much so that many people don't actually believe it. Because it shows God actively using trial and strife in the life of a believer to accomplish his ends. When we read this, we have to conclude that not all storms get to be credited to Satan. Some must, and we'll deal with that later on, but some are hurled upon us by God in his grace and mercy. Now friends, I know we love the parts in the Bible where God calms the storms. I love those parts. I love the parts in the Bible where people get to walk on water. We should celebrate those. But what about when he sends storms and in his grace lets people sink? Sometimes it's he calls me out upon, oh, oh no, under the water. He calls me to sink. Loves that song, by the way, I seriously, seriously do. Because sometimes he does call us to walk upon the water. And sometimes, according to the scripture, he lets us sink. Not upon the water, but beneath it. Into deep, dark spaces of sinking. Now this isn't easy for us to get our head around, especially if we have been through storms ourselves. And so I wanna speak to our hearts a little bit here this morning. Some of us simply believe the narrative that says God wants us always to walk on water and that somehow his hand is limited. That's how we explain most of our sufferings. J.C. Ryle said, of all the doctrines of the Bible, none is so offensive to the human nature as the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. I struggle with it big time, friends, big time. Because I walk with a lot of people in storms and I've experienced a lot. And sometimes I feel like when we're so quick to promote the sovereignty of God in a season of someone's storm, we can actually malign the character of God, which is one of mercy and grace and love and hope and resurrection power. And, and I don't want to do that. I, I want you to trust God's sovereignty today not just fear it, the sovereignty of God is supposed to be a pillow on which you can rest your weary head. It's not supposed to be a stick that beats you into a, a feeling of being lesser than. In fact, I've been in Austin for nearly four months. And over the last few months, I've had opportunity to just meet with congregants and just to chat with them. And, and, and a repeat theme has been people from the stone speaking to me about this exact issue. They were saying, hey, guys, if we so regularly speak of God's sovereignty as we did all the way through First and Second Peter, um, uh, uh, are we not somehow belittling people's sufferings and struggles 
Are we not somehow making them feel like God is cruel and just manipulating the game against them to get his own outcome? Are we not pastoring people poorly through those moments? And I love those questions. Because if you aren't wrestling with the sovereignty of God, you aren't paying attention because it brings some tensions. So let me just walk through some of those tensions today. Let me just address some questions. They may apply to you, you may find them helpful, you may not, um, and I'm at peace with both of those outcomes. Um, Praise God for smartphones, you can check what's going on um, out in the world on Twitter at the moment. But but I think this is gonna be more valuable. I've reworded these questions to make them more concise, but here's the themes I've detected over the last four months. You guys okay? First one is this. If we continue to speak of the sovereignty of God, do we run the risk of removing human dignity, human agency, and human responsibility as a result? If God is in control of, any, of everything, are we just bots in it? And, and does that remove our potential and our responsibility and our ability, our agency to be able to be good news in the world? The answer to this is yes. Yes is the answer and we should be cautious not to because that would be painting a very limited picture of God. I I don't have time for it today, I'm gonna try to write about it this week, but no guarantees, but it's actually the notion of a sovereign creator from which the idea of human dignity, purpose, value, and hope arises. If we believe Psalm 139 that says, he knit you together in your mother's womb, what is that? A sovereign act. And it's from that sovereign act that we actually know that you have dignity regardless of what you go on to look like, which ethnicity you're born into, what your capabilities are like, how much wealth you accumulate, how educated you are, how successful you are in relationships. That's the world's way of measuring worth. The church's way of measuring worth is through the sovereign hand of God who made you. And so sovereignty adds dignity to humanity. This text is gonna show how God values humanity in his sovereignty because he pursues Jonah. He pursues the sailors, he pursues the Ninevites. He sovereignly rules over things in grace to win them back to himself. And they still have a sense of agency, decision-making from which they can respond. So friends, listen, is God sovereign or are people responsible? Yes. Yes is the answer. When things like this seem too mysterious for my walnut-sized brain, then I go to one of the best best brains that God ever made in his sovereignty, the brain of one Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Listen to this lengthy quote from 1858. Sometimes we don't need new knowledge, we just need to look at some old stuff that some really clever cats said, okay? Spurgeon was wrestling with this in his congregation because he was preaching the sovereignty of God. They were going like, does that mean I don't matter? He was going, well, look how he explained it. The system of truth is not one straight line. Is this gonna be there? Yes. But two, no man will ever get a right view of the gospel until he knows how to look at the two lines at once. I am taught in one book to believe that what I sow I shall reap. I am taught in another place, it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. I see in one place God presiding over all in providence, and yet I see, and I cannot help seeing, that man acts as he pleases, and that God has left his actions to his own will in a great measure. Now, if I were to declare that man was so free to act that there was no precedence of God over his actions, I should be driven very near to atheism. And if on the other hand, I declare that God so overrules all things as that man is not free enough to be responsible, I'm driven at once to antinomianism or fatalism. That God predestines and that man is responsible are two things that few can see. They are believed to be inconsistent and contradictory, but they are not. It is just the fault of our weak judgment. Two truths cannot be contradictory to each other. If then, I find taught in one place that everything is foreordained, that is true. And if I find in another place that man is responsible for all his actions, that is true. And it is my folly that leads me to imagine that two truths can ever contradict each other. These two truths I do not believe can ever be welded into one upon any human anvil, but one they shall be in eternity. They are two lines that are so nearly parallel that the mind that shall pursue them farthest will never discover that they converge. But they do converge, and they will meet somewhere in eternity, close to the throne of God, whence all truth doth spring. Second question is, if we speak sovereignty of God, do we run the risk of undermining a sense of his mercy, 
his kindness, his love, and his grace. <laughs> yes, he can. And so we need to be cautious. For some reason, we tend to see a sovereign God as a cruel robotic determinator of outcomes who is aloof and cold and only interested in getting his way like a heavenly Mark Zuckerberg. But what we see here is a loving God, listen, a loving God, sovereignly ordaining a storm to win back lost and desperate souls. What is God's motive in his sovereignty? Love and mercy and kindness and grace, the storm and the waves and the fish, they're all acts, sovereign acts of divine mercy and grace. He is simultaneously saving pagans and sanctifying Jonah. He isn't pushing them further away from him in his wrath and anger. He is sovereignly pulling them towards himself in love. Friends, he might in his sovereignty let you sink, but he will never in his sovereignty let you go. That is our good God. Love and mercy and kindness and power in one. You wanna know a truly unloving God? A truly love, unloving God wouldn't have intervened. He would have let Jonah run in rebellion. He would have let Jonah run away from him and in so doing he would have damned the sailors and the Ninevites to hell. You wanna know a God is truly unloving? You get a God who goes, oh I wish I could help but I can't. That's the worst kind of God. One whose hands are tied, you want that God? Third question, if we speak of the sovereignty of God, do we run the risk of becoming fatalistic or even nihilistic in our response? In other words, do, do we go, hey, it's all predetermined, so who cares? Or hey, it all amounts to nothing, so who cares? Again, yes, if we aren't careful, and I've just got a little, little rebuke for my own heart here this morning that maybe some of you will grab hold of as well. It doesn't help our cause that many of the biggest preachers and teachers of reformed theology of the sovereignty of God are the grumpiest people around. Why would we let people with a small view of God outjoy us? I just don't understand. So here's maybe where we need some correction, where I need some correction, right? My face always looks like this. I'm, I'm joyful on the inside because I believe in the sovereignty of God. I just haven't yet applied the sovereignty of God to my expression, all right, which is, which is wickedness. And so I, I need God to change that so that other people can see that I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. We're deep, 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 deep down in my heart, right? Let it bubble up occasionally. It's not, it's not the worst thing. Total depravity doesn't have to mean utter depravity. Just because we have a low view of man's power to save himself shouldn't mean we have a low view of what humanity is, and so we shouldn't be fatalistic in this stuff. Just because we know we are tainted doesn't mean we have to think that everything sucks all of the time. Some things are awesome, just by God's common grace. Life is more textured and nuanced and glorious than that. It's, it's designed uh, for us to have joy and hope and art and beauty and potential by God's sovereign hand. Now, I was eating barbecue the other day and it was good. I won't tell you where because you'll hate me because you guys mock this place and I think it's awesome, all right? Uh, I'm from Africa, so just don't be prejudiced in your judgment of my food, all right? And so I was eating it and, and I was just it's like, this is amazing. This is incredible. And what I mustn't do in that moment is go like, yeah, but it's tainted by sin and so don't hold too tightly to it. Like, I'm not holding too tightly to it. I'm just enjoying that by God's sovereign hand, someone figured out this combination of flavors. Someone looked at a pig walking past and said, I bet that thing tastes amazing. <laughs> God's common grace. Friends, let's stop and ask what if the opposite is true? If God isn't in control of everything, if he isn't able to bring beauty out of brokenness, then, then we should be miserable and hopeless and prayerless and purposeless and insipid in our worship of God. The fact that God has got this all in control is why we pray and why we sing and why we hope and why we rejoice and why we evangelize and why we hang on and why we look up and why we get back up when we are knocked back down because God won't let us go. Should be the most joyful of all people. Fourth question of the, four, of the first point. So I wanted to be clear. 
If we speak of the sovereignty of God, do we run the risk of becoming sleepy towards the work of Satan in the world? The answer again is yes. I said that not every storm in this life is the work of Satan, but some of them are, to be sure. What you see here is kind of like Genesis 50, 20, where bad stuff happens and God and his sovereignty works it for good. Sometimes that's gonna happen in our lives. Satan would have wanted this all to go another way, to be sure, but the Lord. Friends, Christians who have a big view of the sovereignty of God still need to watch for the work of the enemy. They just don't need to obsess over the work of the enemy because they know that he is defeated. You guys okay? Some of you are in serious storms. You might feel like you're sinking. And you may have temporarily comforted yourself with the notion of a God who isn't actually in control of any of this. That may feel comforting to you temporarily. But what if it is the great storm thrower waking you up, pulling you close, sending you again? All right, second observation. I promise, I'm so close to done. You're not even gonna believe it. Second one. We show our understanding of grace. So God's grace can be the calming of storms and the sending of storms. We show our understanding of grace in the way that we respond to the storms in our lives. That's when the storms come that we know if we believe in grace or not. There's a couple of interesting responses here. How does Jonah respond? Well, Jonah sleeps. (laughs) He's asleep to the work of God, asleep to the need of the sailors, asleep to the fate of Nineveh, just asleep. This is not the contented sleep of Jesus in the boat in a storm. Jesus slept easy because he knew that he ruled over the wind and the waves. This is the sleep of escapism. Jonah sleeps because he doesn't know that God rules over the wind and the waves. He thinks he can numb himself away from the relentless pursuit of God. Friends, how many of us have lulled ourselves to sleep or at least trying God has been pressing in on us over a period of time and instead of responding, we have dialed out, we have escaped, or we have just nodded off. We've nodded off. I'm reminded of the exhortation in Ephesians 5. This is is very similar to what the sailors say to Jonah. And Paul is explaining to the church in Ephesus that belief in Christ brings about new behavior. And he quotes Isaiah 26 when he says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. I feel like the Lord would say to many of us from this text this morning, simply awake, sleeper, rise from the dead, know who you are in Christ. Let him catch up with you, let him change you, let him send you, and he will shine on you. Or how did the mariners respond? I love this, and Jonah does to an extent as well in his willingness to be thrown overboard. They respond by just throwing themselves on the mercy of God. Tells us a couple of times they're terrified. They don't know how it would end. They don't even know lots about their new God. They haven't studied systematic theology. They aren't church members. Their first baptismal service has been a disaster. But they throw themselves fully on God's mercy, praying, repenting, sacrificing, trusting, changing the way that they live. Friends, listen, I may be a bit of a simpleton, don't nod with too much vigor I'm in agreement to that, because I likely am. But I have noticed that God moves mightily in my life in seasons when I throw myself fully upon his grace and mercy. Some of you are standing off to the side, still wanting to pursue the multiple options of polytheism, still wanting God to give you adequate answers for why he sent the storms in the first place. Some of us simply need to imitate the faith of the sailors this morning and say, I don't know but I'm yours, I'm yours. I can remember nearly 15 years ago in a little church in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg singing a Hillsong song, which is still precious to me to this day, called Take All of Me. Do you guys, anyone remember this song? And I can remember clearly kneeling down in an aisle in a church service saying, singing, I love you and all of my hope is in you. Jesus Christ, take my life. Take all of me. And in that moment, I threw myself upon his mercy and my life has never been the same. Simple response of faith. All right, last observation. The good news is this. God in his grace didn't just send a storm. God in his grace didn't just let Jonah sink. God in his grace sent a better Jonah. Just go with me quickly to Matthew 12 as I wrap this up. We'll read this text pretty much every week in this series. But in Matthew 12, Jesus is confronted by religious people who think that God works for them. Right? A lot of what our hearts are doing at the moment. No, no, you stay there. This is how you work. And this is what these religious folk wanted in their day. And so they come to Jesus, verse 38, and some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Like dance, little religious monkey, dance, right? Like do the thing that we want you to do. 
and then get back in your box. And he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Here is the great news. God in his sovereignty sent someone better than Jonah. Sent by the same God who pursued rebels like Jonah and pursued rebels through Jonah, that same God sent his son, Jesus Christ. He didn't rebel. He was obedient to the call. And yet, and yet, and yet, God let him sink into three days of darkness and death. But then, in God's sovereignty, and according to God's preordained purposes, he rose again, making a way for the rest of us rebels to be with him again. In order to do that, we have to trust him. We have to follow where he leads us. We have to give up the pretense We have to let sin be brought to light through repentance. We have to cast ourselves on the mercy of God. Friends, God can send storms. God might even let you sink. But God did send his son. And so while he may let you sink, he will never let you go. That's our good and merciful and kind and sovereign Lord. Father God, thank you so much um, for your word. I pray that this word um, doesn't return to you void. Uh, I pray I pray that it would be effective in hearts in this place, that you would reach out. Um, to those rebelling against you, those running away from you, and that you would remind them of your glorious mercy and grace and power. But God, I want to pray for those in the room this morning who are in seasons of storms. They haven't known what to do with your character in the midst of that season. I pray this morning you would encourage them deeply. And so friends, we, let's just do this. This is just, I think the Spirit's just trying to give us a moment. To, you can do this in your campuses as well. But if you're in the middle of a tumultuous season of storm, tumultuous, and in spite of that season this morning, you are saying you want to throw yourself on the mercy of God. And let him do what he wants so that he'll sovereignly bring you to the other side. Why don't you just stand briefly in this place? We would love to pray for you. It's a storm in your life. It's causing distress. It's causing anguish. It's causing pain. But you don't want it to be a season that presses you away from God. You want it to be a season that presses you towards him. Just stand. It's just one Humble act of saying, I'm yours. If you're around someone who's standing, why don't you just reach out a hand? Why don't you just join me as as we pray? Father God, I pray for these precious souls. I pray that in this season where Satan would seek to push them away from you, where Satan Satan would seek to malign your character and say, you see, your God doesn't care. I pray that in this season, you would press in so near and close to them, Father, that they would step on Satan's head afresh, full of an understanding of your goodness and mercy and kindness. I pray that their testimony as they get out the other end of this would be, God let me sink, but he did not let me go. 
Oh, I pray that your sovereignty would be a sweet, soothing balm to them, a pillow that they can rest their head upon, not a stick which would beat them further. I pray that this season, Father, would be a sweet season of rest where you would do your work, where you would not relent, where you would accomplish your good and sovereign purposes through these marvelous rebels in the midst of a storm. Have your way with them and with us. Teach us to trust you, Lord. Teach us to trust in your sovereignty and to believe in your mercy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.